It is time now for Morning Rounds with CBS News Chief Medical Correspondent Dr. John LaPook and CBS News contributor Dr. Holly Phillips. First up, a government advisory board sounded an alarm this week about ovarian cancer. Every year, more than 22,000 women in the United States are diagnosed. And because it's often caught too late, more than 14,000 die. Here's John with more. You can see that. The report found surprising gaps in what we know about ovarian cancer, starting with a basic definition. Even though it's called ovarian cancer, it can start outside the ovary, in the fallopian tubes or the uterus. These are all tumors. Dr. Douglas Levine heads the gynecology research lab at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center and was one of the report authors. It's a collection of many different diseases. The subtypes of ovarian cancer all occur in or around the ovary, but they have very different origins. Why is that important? When you start to figure out the origins, it tells you information that's important about treatment, prevention, and mechanisms of developing cancer. Prevention is key because right now there's no effective way of finding ovarian cancer early. One reason the disease is so deadly. 34-year-old Morgan Melnikoff, mother of three, got genetic testing last fall and learned she was at increased risk. I was not going to gamble with my life, um, especially knowing that they would not be able to catch ovarian cancer in its early stages. So Melnikoff opted for preventive surgery. In her case, that meant removing the ovaries, fallopian tubes, and a full hysterectomy. I had to do it. It's very frustrating as a patient. You can screen for breast cancer. You can screen for colon cancer. Why is ovarian cancer so different? The precursor cells turn into cancer and then spread very quickly. We really have a very limited yeah. window of opportunity to identify the cancer cells. Good, yes. So what are the symptoms for a patient, for a person, if they have ovarian cancer? That's the big problem. Very often there are no symptoms, or they're so vague, they're gastrointestinal, things that look like irritable bowel syndrome, so bloating, discomfort, some change in bowel habits, maybe some pelvic pain, but nothing that's specific that says, ah, that's ovarian cancer, which is why we are so desperate for new ways of picking this up early. All right, next up, new findings on sudden cardiac arrest. Each year, there are over 350,000 out-of-hospital cases of sudden cardiac arrest in the U.S., but recent research suggests there may be warning signs before this often deadly condition strikes. Holly, what are the warning signs? Sure, well, you know, Anthony, just as you said, we used to think that cardiac arrest happened just out of the blue, that there really weren't any sim uh, symptoms that we could pick up on. But the, re the recent research that you mentioned suggested more than half of people have some symptoms in the days or weeks before they have a cardiac arrest, and almost 90% have some symptoms within the first 24 hours before they have the arrest. Uh, but most significantly, more than 80% of people, the vast majority, don't act on those symptoms. They don't call 911. So, and that might be in part because they don't recognize them. Now, some of the symptoms we associate with heart problems like chest pain or shortness of breath. Others are more subtle and we might not necessarily think they relate to our heart. Uh, things like nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain or back pain, flu-like symptoms or even syncope, passing out. Fatigue so, also. Yeah, that's another one. But then what is the difference? I think most people don't even know the difference between cardiac arrest and a heart attack. Yeah, that is, I think, the biggest misconception. So a heart attack is there are tiny blood vessels that supply the heart muscle, it's a muscle, with blood. When one of those gets blocked or narrowed, then the part of that heart, that muscle that's supplied by that blood vessel, can die. It can get too little blood flow and just die. That's just a part, though, of the whole heart. So the whole heart can still beat, even though part of it is limping along because part of the heart muscle has died. That's different than in a cardiac arrest. In a cardiac arrest, you have too little blood flow often, or there are other causes, that cause the heart to, instead of beating like this regularly, pumping out blood, to start beating like a bag of worms, like this. It's conditions called ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation. Well, like this, the blood is not coming out in an in a ordinary way, and so suddenly, and just like that, you get no blood flow going up to the carotid arteries, to the brain, and you go down. In that case, for every minute of delay getting shocked, because a shock can save your life, for every minute delay, your survival goes down 10%. So by 10 minutes, 
very little chance. Well, so then if you have, you know, diagnosed this is happening to someone and you're in the room, mm -hmm. what should you do in that, I guess, minute, the first seconds, really? Right, right. Well, what John said was, was absolutely right. The survival rate is dismal. Less than 10% of people survive. It's also a really difficult illness. It's a difficult condition because it strikes in the prime of life, right? Right around the age of 65. But what's interesting about cardiac arrest is that it's reversible for many, many people if you act on it right away, in, within the first few minutes. So the very first step, no matter what, is to call 911, get EMS on their way over. Then grab a defibrillator, also called an AED, if you're in a place that has one, and use it. Uh, CPR should be started right away and continue the CPR until EMS arrives. No matter what the patient looks like or even whether or not you think it's working, continue it straight through. Um, in an ideal setting, there would be two people. One person could call 911 and grab the defibrillator while the other does CPR. I think, John, a lot of people, even if they may know CPR, are kind of afraid to perform it in an emergency situation. How do you get them to overcome this fear? Right. Often they're afraid of invading their personal space or of hurting them. And I can tell you, sadly, I was just involved in an experience last week where a woman collapsed, middle-aged woman, and I was the first person there to start CPR. So I did mouth to mouth, I did CPR. We used the defibrillator and uh, she actually, we got there soon enough that she had a shockable rhythm. So you put the pads on and if the person's fine, if they have a pulse, by the way, it'll say, you know, do nothing. But we were able to uh, give her a shock. Unfortunately, she died. Um, and um, it was incredibly sad, but I will tell you this in terms of people deciding to do it or not. When I spoke to the husband that night, of 32 years, he was so grateful that at least somebody did something. Right. Right. All right. Dr. John LaPook, Dr. Holly Phillips, thank you both very much.